Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I actually feel very honored to be chosen to give the Nigerian lecture. And I also had the pleasure of presenting a, the Nigerian lecture at the ASTS in 2021. So I'm somehow connected when you, to Nigerian, even though I didn't train under him and I trained under Dr. Starzo. Uh, which is, you know, in Pittsburgh, you don't mention Minnesota, and in Minnesota, you don't mention Pittsburgh. <laughs> right, but um, two, definitely two different paths of surgeons and training and techniques, and, but in the end result is that we all, our goal is to achieve the same endpoint, and that is providing uh, care for patients and delivering uh, really uh, that treatment that's needed when it comes to transplantation, uh, end-stage renal disease, and, and uh, liver disease. So I am honored to be here. I've met Dr. Nigerian several times, but always I usually at a meeting or a conference in, with Dr. Starzo, uh, and you know, just always saw him as a, a big giant compared to my petite size, and um, knowing he, just an incredible man growing up in, uh, in my training, uh, and learning about all that he had done to ad advance the field of uh, transplantation. So I have no, fin well, I have one financial disclosure. With, I thought it was 12 months, but 24 months. I work as a consultant for CareDX and providing um, lectures for them. So my only disclosure. So for you in the audience, I'm going to present a dilemma, a test for unconscious bias. And so here's the challenge for you. A father and son was involved in a horrific car crash and the man died at the scene. But when the child arrived at the hospital and was rushed into the operating room, the surgeon pulled away and said, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. How can this be? I'll let you think about this for a minute. No whispering to each other. Uh, if you know what, if you have the answer, raise your hand. Well, I told this to my husband and he deliberated over and over again. Uh, maybe he has two fathers, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I said, I, how could you not get this answer? And uh, it's, you know, because we are, trained in our minds to think about what the typical surgeon is. And so for many, it's, you know, it's coming around, going around in every which way, trying to decide what the answer is. And, but as many of you may be aware, uh, let me go back to this slide, we, we are conditioned to think a certain way. And while it's not obvious, don't worry about the fact that you didn't get the answer because the point of the riddle really is to unearth our own biases and show us that all of us have biases and it's reflected in how we think and in our behavior. And the sneaky nature of, of unconscious bias is that we're not aware that, we're, that we have them or, and it makes it harder to identify uh, and to do something about it. So for those of you who didn't get it, it was the surgeon was his mother. And so bias is a preference or negative attitude, belief or treatment towards an individual or group that can be explicit or implicit depending on the relationship with your own uh, conscious awareness. And so we, when we think about implicit racial bias is your unconscious attitude towards a person based on, on the race and and these biases can be influenced by our family, by our friends, the stereotypes of, that we have are of others that are not like us. And this can impact how we value others, how we treat others, and how we engage in a daily basis. And, and oftentimes when we think about within our own medical setting and reflected in our attitudes towards the medical students, or even when it comes to recruitment and retaining future health professionals from different racial and ethnic minority groups. And so these attitudes, attitudes can hamper the way we diversify our workforce uh, and have a negative impact on others. So we want to be careful about, we want to be able to say, yes, we all have biases, um, simply identifying them and realizing that you can, can 
uh, put that in check early on. And there are almost endless number of ways which society has categorized uh, people over time. Your social identity is, is based on how you fit into these various groups. And we all have different social identities. We, for me, I may be a female, I may be black, uh, maybe a woman, I may be a Christian. And so these build my, my, my own background. And, and so how you identify within your own group, uh, you know, causes you to build that self-esteem and tied to your social standing within that society, social identity group. group. So we tend to embrace the social identity of others who uh, look like us or, uh, and make us feel welcome. And even when they support us and respect us. And so sometimes when this doesn't go the right way, then we can end up with an uncomfortable situation for, for those who find themselves alienated. So in this article, Assessment of Perceptions of Professionalism among Faculty, Training, and Staff, uh, Dr. Alexis in his, her ask, article asked the question, are current professional standards in the healthcare workforce and the learning environment inclusive of all groups. And the objective here was to examine how professionalism is perceived in diverse healthcare environments. And the setting really was in terms of um, looking at collecting data from 2015 to 2015, 2017 at various hospitals affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania, over 3,000 respondents. 64% were women, 11% were Hispanic, Black, were non-Hispanic, Black, and 10 identified as LGBTQ group. And so the first question was, I have considered changing jobs due to inappropriate disruptive or unprofessional behavior by a coworker or supervisor. And the re those who responded, who identified as LGBTQ, women and non-Hispanic Blacks and other minority groups were more likely to answer positive to this question. And when you look at the percentages varying from 15 to 20% uh, felt that they would consider changing their job. The question, my institution supports the culture of professionalism was sort of split down the middle. There was no significant difference in the responses for those who agreed or disagreed. And some of the representative quotes for the theme, marginalized populations experiencing professionalism differently uh, was some things like, I have felt gender and bias on several occasions. Um, I've been spoken down to, disrespected and outright ignored. Um, residents of color often get criticized and feel like they're under the microscope. I think about conversations where people say I don't fit in and describing others as different. Uh, pressures to, be, to, to become more like a white person and heavily tattooed person, the stares, the comments, the general dismissal of me as a colleague was a daily struggle. So we may not be conscious of what we're doing when it comes to uh, the students, the faculty, and those around us. And so uh, for many of those who are minorities, even who are women who were LGBTQ, for them it's what do you see when you look at me? And as a black female surgeon, that had been my question time and time again, because people see me as a black woman, not necessarily as the first black female transplant surgeon, when I go into the play, any situation, if I'm in the elevator, or I may not be dressed in Gucci and Chanel, and I get on the elevator, and a little white lady goes to the back of the elevator, clutches her bag and put it on the other side, that's her implicit bias because she sees me as a threat. Why? Because I am black. And so you categorize, and that's just a, a stereotype, and a bias on her part. So be conscious of how you, you think about others and identity plays a, a large part of how we move through the world and how, how systems and our people treat others and the opportunities that are available to us to correct that. We know that there are policies and practices ingrained in our daily lives that benefit people of social, certain social identities over others and maintaining that power held by those are considered to have been privileged. So we, how, how you see me matters, how you see the medical student matter, 
the Latinx resident, the LBGTQ surgeon, or the Ethiopian consultant. So think about that as you go through your daily life because there are consequences to this and the, the consequences of bias, racial, whether it's racial or not, uh, can cause much harm. It can cause stress, uh, insecurity, those feeling excluded, uh, marginalized. And it's often good when you talk to students who report positive experiences with racial or ethnic minority group patients during clinical placement because they feel appreciated by those patients in a healthcare setting. And those positive interactions matter uh, for at the end of the day, you really wanna feel like your presence uh, made a difference to that patient. So even as physicians, just imagine what we, how we treat each other and our biases to each other, how the patient feels if we carry those same preferences and biases into the way we treat our patients. And it's important to be aware of that, even for patients who are disabled, are physically challenged. And so in this review of implicit bias in healthcare professionals, it examines the, the evidence that professionals, healthcare professionals display implicit bias towards the patients. Uh, some of these examples in, in these articles were, uh, while in looking through all these articles, there were 35 that found evidence of implicit bias in healthcare professionals. And all of the studies that were investigated found a significant positive relationship between the level of implicit bias and the lower quality of care delivered to, to patients. And so it's important to know that you as a physician may use your own biases when treating patients. Uh, physicians estimated the, the estimates of social economic status would, of a patient based on race may, may somehow come into play when they think about how that patient would be treated. And in those studies where there was no finding of implicit bias, um, such as in inner city clinics where many of the physicians were born outside the United States and were therefore less likely to have that sense of privilege. In, sorry, my slide is off a little bit. So in this article, implicit bias became one of the major reasons why Latino men were less likely to receive optimal treatment for high-risk prostate cancer. Uninsured non-Latino white men were 37% more likely to receive definitive treatment when compared to those uninsured. But for Latinos, they were 66%, almost twice, less likely to undergo definitive treatment. So certainly we know the issue is facing uh, um, maternal um, and maternal click care when it comes to Latinos and, and women of color, uh, despite the fact that we have so much available to us. Uh, white male physicians were less likely to prescribe pain medication to black patients than to white patients. And in this, in this uh, article on diversity and inclusion, implicit bias, there were two areas of study. Uh, recognize implicit bias in healthcare disparities. And again, through all the reviews, um, clinical and economic outcomes were worse in those patients who were black or African-American when it comes to length of stay uh, compared to white patients, higher in-hospital mortality, and also for uh, blacks and Hispanic surgeries, were they found that low volume surgeons operated on these patients compared with only 44% of white patients and 90% of patients in high volume surgeons were in high volume surgeons were white. So it really points to the issue of implicit bias in the surgical workforce. And so uh, in, in this article, Dr. Lopez, he, he, one of the things is that he pointed out is that the disparities in surgery and the role of implicit bias is not just in patient care, but also in the, in the development of a diverse workforce. And one, some of the issues that were found were poor communication with the patient, patients feeling disrespected uh, by both the residents and the staff, and those who were of lower socioeconomic status felt that the care was inadequate. So, these things need to be considered and I wanted to really point this out. So how can implicit bias influence behavior and decisions within 
or patients, well, when patients feel disrespected, they're more likely to avoid going back for care because they feel it's a waste of time. Uh, it's, you're not really have the interest of that patient at heart. And so this results in delays in seeking help and also in feeling or not really understanding the medications that are prescribed. And, and this gets perpetuated in families. If you as a parent feel there's no point in going to the doctor, then you don't take your, 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 the rest of your family to the doctor, or they may convey the same feelings because it happened to my grandmother or it happened to my, my, my parent. The lack of, of, of trust uh, lends to lower participation in screening, high treatment dropout, and lower ratings of healthcare quality because of that implicit bias, that disrespect or feeling of inadequate care. And so what are health disparities? The healthy people 2030 define health disparities as a particular type of health difference that's closely linked to social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. And so the Center for Disease Control defines health disparities as preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, or opportunities to achieve optimal health experienced by socially disadvantaged racial, ethnic, and other population groups of, um, and communities. So these differences are, you have to recognize. And so when we think about these, um, they could be your socioeconomic status, your gender, your age, your, your physical disability, your sexual orientation. Um, and the point is that these are preventable differences. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to achieve optimum health. So how do we get there? When you think about health equity, it's not the same as equality because different patients need different amount of, may have different amount of issues and addressing those barriers or different barriers to achieve in the same endpoint. And so the goal of health equity is to attain the highest level of health for all patients. It requires valuing the patients equally, focusing on the avoidable, addressing the avoidable inequities that are maybe historical, maybe contemporary injustices and the elimination of health and of health in order to achieve healthcare disparities. So when you see uh, providing the same opportunity for some patients may not achieve the level that of, uh, of, of health, the better health outcome that, you're, that you desire because they may need without addressing the barriers that, are, that exist for each patient. So when we think about these barriers, we think about the social determinants of health. And though healthcare is essential to health, the health outcomes are driven by multiple factors, which may include genetics, health behaviors, social and environmental factors. And each of these factors of health suggests that these, these are which we refer to as the social de determinants of health, whether it's education and access. So does the person speak the same language? Uh, are they interpreting you wrong? So that communication key is, becomes important. The type of healthcare they're receiving, uh, they, may not, they may be going to the Med Express as an emergency room for their care, as opposed to having someone who has a vested interest in them. When we think about neighborhood and built environments, so, so often even within transplant, we tell the patient, okay, you need to uh, exercise, uh, join the gym, uh, walk around your neighborhood. They, those things may not be possible depending on where they live and the access that they have. So you think about who their support, economic stability. Uh, we don't think twice when we give a patient a prescription of whether or not they can afford it uh, and how it interacts with all the other things they have to pay for. Um, and so we'll, you know, when we think, of, think about compliance and though and so this just breaks down uh, in much more detail when we think about the debt the patient has, the medical bills, um, whether the education, the literacy, the language, um, the food options, at, you mean patients live in food deserts uh, and you're telling them they need to eat a healthy diet, get a yogurt and an apple a day. Well, the bodega down the block from these patients may not have the kind of things that you want the patient to eat. So these are things to 
that are important to consider as we look at the barriers for health. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this article, again, it's another comprehensive review of the outcomes. Uh, when we look by Dr. Uh, Hader, when we look at patient, provider, and systemic factors. And this research was, while it was done earlier, the idea is that it focuses on the things that prevent patients from getting there. This was a comprehensive review. Uh, 88 art articles met the inclusion criteria. They're assessed for patient factors such as insurance, economic stability, willingness to undergo surgery, provider factors such as the type of surgery and the surgeon based on volume and uh, quality, systemic factors such as access, hospital volume, patient population, and access to clinical trials. And so part of the outcomes again showed pretty much the same thing. Uh, black patients were significantly more likely to die in hospital than white patients. Underinsured or, or, or uninsured patients um, on low income predict inadequate access to optimal and timely surgery and poor surgical outcomes. And when you look at the OPTN data, show that when we think about patients in greater access to transplantation, those who were in the high uh, socioeconomic status had greater access to transplantation compared to those in the low socioeconomic status. And so just tying all these factors together, when we look back, the overlap for all, whether it was systemic provider and patient related, lower likelihood of surgery and willingness to undergo surgery um, was tied into all of these different factors. And so patients had distrust of their doctor, those who didn't have enough money or they were, couldn't afford it, uh, often avoided getting the surgery or were, were often maybe even uh, bundled into those with a low volume, low capacity uh, hospital when it comes to access to care. And so these same factors play a role when we think about disparities in transplantation. Uh, are they related to patient or is it our physician or systemic factors? We know for African-Americans is always and continues despite changes in the allocation system that we still have referral to listing, uh, wait list adherence, preemptive transplantation time and time again. When you think about those who preemptive transplantation requires an early diagnosis, a diagnosis before dialysis, which uh, is not something that is as prevalent within the African-American community, living uh, kidney donation. So these are just, these are also some of the same factors when we think about disparities um, they are non-modifiable factors, but they are also modifiable ones. And that and most of us go uh, develop immunosuppressive protocols to achieve equal graft and patient survival. But acknowledging and understanding these barriers would allow transplant centers and dialysis facilities to make the necessary interventions to help mitigate these disparities and optimize transplant evaluation process as well as patient outcomes. So when we think about inequities in transplantation uh, and addressing the racial and ethnic disparities, we know that this remains in part an important but difficult issue due to the uncomfortable nature of discussing racial and ethnic divides. Um, this article from Mass General Research said research has shown that members of racial and ethnic minority groups often receive lower quality care compared to their white counterparts. And this may be unintentional based on the providers, but using, but somehow having that implicit bias based, implicit racial bias. And so these same factors, which are barriers to social, to adequate care are important to address even within transplant, transplantation. Racial disparities in access were, I tried to find article that went more than 20 years ago. And so when you think about the literature and the, the articles, the publications on racial disparities and access to renal transplantation, they go back 25 years. Uh, and, but in the end, 
most of these articles will end with uh, there's more work to be done, a greater research is done to, needed to really define the problem. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, without really digging into the issues, this becomes one of the things that we deal with, even though it was 25 years ago, we're still dealing with these things now. So racial disparities and access is really becomes important in addressing because <clears throat> this determines who gets to transplant. Uh, who is the appropriate patient? I was saying last night that when I was in South Alabama, a patient could not be evaluated for a transplant unless they were approved by their physician before they went to the transplant center, which was then it becomes a, an, a <laughs> having that physician to decide who was appropriate, who was an appropriate candidate for transplantation. And even after I got to, to Delaware, I was still getting calls from patients who felt that they were denied getting on the transplant list, uh, even though they felt that they were appropriate uh, patients. So these things do exist, and those are the bias, uh, bias of some of our physicians and our healthcare system. Uh, one nephrologist asked me, why should I transplant Mrs. So-and-so? Because he didn't see that she was a benefit to society. So who decides that? And so when you have a system that's based on referrals, one of the things that we constantly tell our patients is that and our fa patients' families is that you can make that initial contact to the transplant center if you feel that you're not being referred appropriately. So in this article, why black patients are disproportionately left all transplant waitlist. Again, uh, we don't have, while well, for end-stage renal disease, we have the network system that registered all patients on dialysis and we have a Medicare oversight that uh, have rules and regulations about getting patients referred for transplantation because they're covered by, by Medicare, have that uh, end-stage liver disease registry that allows for patients to be monitored before they need a liver or before uh, or if they need a liver. And so it really then is based on that referral basis. And within the black community, so oftentimes you find someone who may have liver disease and not getting appropriately for referral. So it becomes on the on the one hand, is the person taking care of that patient knowledgeable about the benefits of, of, of transplantation or maybe even not seeing that patient as suitable or what we say non-compliant. So oftentimes the issue for many patients may be travel distance uh, and at high volume centers or, or inner cities that may not be an issue, but as you go further out in rural communities, some of this may often be an issue. Disproportionate access to private health insurance, as well as lack of knowledge, both on the practitioner's side, as well as the patient when it comes to transplant options. Racial disparities in, in liver listing, uh, in liver transplantation listing, again, pretty much the same issue. And again, this study shows in, in looking at Hispanic patients, uh, comparing Hispanic to non-Hispanic and the issue of end-stage renal disease, referring by your GI doctor, knowledge and attitudes, again, fits into this algorithm. And we know that within uh, transplantation, we've had the issue of uh, uh, faulty formulas that led to inadequate care in kidney care, the EGFR, and the built-in uh, equation of having race, uh, which denied, allowed for many patients who are are black to have a higher EGFR compared to a white person with all criteria being equal. Uh, and with the EGFR of the same height weight BMI uh, for a white person, maybe eight EGFR of 18, but you put in the race coefficient and suddenly you've got an EGFR of 23 to 25 for a person who is black, which keeps them off the transplant list. And so with the recognition of this, certainly we've made a progress and we've, the goal is to eliminate uh, that race factor uh, and allow uh, many more patients to be listed appropriately for transplantation. And uh, Christiana Caird, the nephrologist said it was a, he had to go back and recalculate all these patients and we, and bring them forward to be listed for transplant because they were sitting outside the recommended 
the AST, uh, American Society of Transplantation, in looking at the kidney donor index, the KDPI, and uh, the liver donor risk index, uh, having that factor of race really uh, allows patients, one, it gives you a higher KDPI, which in many patients been, who ask for what's the KDPI of, of, this, of this kidney or will decline it because uh, prospectively it gives a poor outcome. And so these conversations are necessary because the, this potential overestimation of graph failure may affect the, the algorithms and organ selection for so many patients and the opportunity for more patients to participate in the organ donor pro process. So these are conversations that are necessary in addressing the use of race in clinical algorithms and research. That's unproven as to whether it makes a difference to the equitable benefit to all patients. In this article, how our organ transplant system fail patients of color by Joe Mullen in, it says in the United States, the pathway to organ transplantation is complicated. It's full of potholes that impede access, riddled with crevices in which people fall and never emerge. The early stages of that course could include primary specialty and hospital care, all of which play a role in the patient's evaluation disease management and referral to transplantation. So it's important to address the inequities that patients have and starting from uh, the primary care referral process through the journey to getting on the wait list, getting a transplant and a person's race and other characteristics should not determine the quality of care that the system provides for them. Uh, and so many times within we know within transplantation uh, in itself, even within surgery, we label patients as non-compliant. So what exactly is non-compliance? Non-compliance conveys what the patient isn't doing, not what she, he or she is doing. So oftentimes the pharmacist is upset because patient didn't take the medication. Did it take the time to find out why they didn't purchase the medication? Uh, you didn't show up for clinic again. Perhaps you need to involve the social worker to see, is it transportation an issue? Maybe they missed the bus. Maybe they have kids and they couldn't find a babysitter. Uh, the diet recommendations. I constantly chuckle when the, the, the nutritionist um, berates the Hispanic man uh, patient for constantly eating too many uh, eating beans. And you have to cut out, you cannot eat so many beans. Well, he is Hispanic. That's a staple in his diet. So you make adjustments uh, without assuming that what you can do uh, is what they can do. Uh, he did not keep his referral appointment. Did you explain to the patient what exactly this referral appointment entailed uh, and what the benefits of it and have a conversation with that patient? So we, oftentimes when you listen to these conversations, you, you get this tone of disdain as if the patient had not followed these instructions and that they are to blame for their health problems. If only he would do so and so, he would do better. So whether, rather than assume that the patient is lacking in motivation or dis being disengaged, inquire about the barriers to that patient, what difficulties they're facing, uh, what are the obstacles to adhering to treatment? Is there a literacy issue, a trouble with interpretation? Or trouble with English. Oftentimes patients of different ethnic background would shake their head and say, yes, 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 to what you're saying. But in actual fact, they really don't understand what you're saying. Even my, my um, white Anglo-Saxon partner from North Dakota, his, he would go on and on to the patients and he comes out the room and the patient looks at me and say, I don't understand a word he said. So you have to make sure that you're speaking in terms that the patient can understand. And that's very important. And it goes back to, again, looking at the social determinants of health for these patients. We may live within our own box and our own geographic area and our own way of life may not necessarily be the way that the patient is living. And so when we think about these things, 
we realize that when we look at, when we address the barriers to health, and the only point part of this slide here is to realize that your clinical care contributes about 20% to health outcomes. Health behaviors, socioeconomic factors, physical environment, all these things, quality of life, all these things factor in to positive outcomes. Why do we continue to follow patients after transplant? Because we want good outcomes. We want good, we want the graft to survive, but in order to get the graft to survive, you have to make sure the patient's doing what they're doing. So it's a monitored system that supplies the nutritionist, the social worker, uh, the dietitian, And so those things are built in, in our own little domain of transplantation so that we can have success and greater outcomes for a patient. Unfortunately, after five years, we dismiss them. And you know, that's the end of that. Not to say, that's just a joke. Um, but it's important if you take that same model and put it into healthcare, then the goal is be able to say, perhaps we can make a dent in, in lowering the issues of, of um, health disparities. Cultural competence. This was an article uh, discussed in the ACS and back in 2012, understanding that cultural competence is understanding what is at the core of the environment that influence your own behavior, your own beliefs and your own uh, health decisions. It's about understanding the specific culture, language and socioeconomic aspects of your patient and being sensitive to the limitations that they may be facing. And without understanding that, you cannot deliver the best care to your patient. So when we think about cultural competency, uh, embracing this means appreciating the differences in individuals from a variety of cultural and ethnic groups within the, the organization where you work, live and play. Avoid stereotyping your patients, seeing them as individuals and respecting and valuing the cultural difference. Uh, sometimes we feel uncomfortable being around people who are different. And sometimes when you do the cultural challenge test, you ask your audience to consider sitting with someone who's not like you. You know, in, in college and even as medical students, you tend to gravitate together because you feel comfortable sitting with those that look like you and dress like you and share the same thoughts. But break out of your mold and try understanding those who are different uh, than, than who don't speak your same language, don't have the same social factors. Uh, and typically we want, and that would, by understanding them more, we are then more open to uh, how they think and having that cultural competence and cultural humility, processing self-reflection and self-critiquing where the individual may not only learn about another culture, but examines their own beliefs and cultural identities. And so this becomes important to embracing our differences when it comes to others so that they feel accepted and not rejected. Um, for instance, having, when I lived in Pittsburgh, I lived for many years right next to a very Hasidic Jewish neighborhood. And we were initially offended when they refused to shake our hands, but it wasn't against us. That was their practice as much as a male, male patient, male Jewish patient explained um, he was studying, to, he was a, a rabbi in training, he came in for his kidney transplant. And he explained to me that I couldn't operate on him because I was a female and I could not see him naked. And so while I initially was taken back, I had to realize that this was, this was his religion, this was his culture. And so I said, no problem, I'm gonna call my white, Jewish male partner, and he will come in and do your transplant. So it becomes, you have to recognize that not to be offended, but to be really uh, embrace those differences. And so when we think about implicit bias, again, we want to have those attitudes. We want to make sure we check our attitudes towards other people and be conscious about how we stereotype them. Uh, and so contrary to our own stated beliefs, we want to be able to say that we want to treat everyone with equity, uh, which we believe to be true. And so when we see our patients, uh, we wanna be, we wanna see, we wanna think about how we're, are we seeing that patient? Patients want to be seen. They wanna they, they want be heard. You, they want someone to listen to them. 
Uh, and so sometimes we, explic we are taught to go in and rant off what we think the patient wrong with the patient um, simply because that's the way we were told, that's the way we were raised as physicians, but take the time to sit and listen to your patient. Our biases are developed early in life and these are reinforced through our personal, uh, through, throughout our lifetime actually. And if many of you ever have the occasion to take the implicit association test that was developed in 1998 to measure bias, um, uh, take one of the tests. Some people say it's flawed, uh, but even for me, I was surprised about the bias that I uh, found when I took that test. So just a challenge to many of you. So you wanna be able to check your unconscious bias and see the patient for who they are. Our biases are manifested in healthcare in various ways. We've talked about preventive care. Uh, patients feel overlooked and dismissed. And it, communication barriers, the level of trust and rapport between who your patient and, your, and you as a provider. If you have that, when you look at patients at lawsuits and medical lawsuits, many times patients sue because of that lack of communication. Uh, and so you want to be conscious of your, your stereotyping and your assumptions. And so in summary, our biases shape how we practice medicine. Some of these can re re result in unequal treatment of patients. And we want to be conscious of our, our behavior. Uh, consider learning tools and on implicit bias in clinical situations and make sure there's buy-in from your organization at all levels, incorporating uh, implicit bias training for all employees, trainees within the diversity, equity, and inclusion di division that may exist. Uh, these were some recommendations for addressing health disparities from Mass General Hospital Leadership Program Report, know who's involved, organization, know engagement from on top. Uh, shape the culture of your organization by integrating equity into everyday operations. Create a vision to make focus on human outcomes and financial benefits of equal treatment. Engage your organization and, and your audience and harness the power of a collaborative network, finding support for those professionals who are working to reduce disparities. Thank you so much for the occasion to present this morning and I, it's my honor to be here and I thank you for listening to my presentation. Any questions? There's one in the back, we'll start. Thank you for that talk, that was uh, very interesting. I'm Ben Brown, I'm a PGY1. I was curious to hear how you think about disentangling the uh, organ allocation algorithm versus and the sources of, of bias and, and of racially inequitable outcomes uh, that it produces, whether it's the algorithm or whether it's an algorithm that's, you know, maybe theoretically without issue, but that it's operating in a racist society. I guess, you know, do you think that it's the algorithm or the inputs or both? How do you, how do you disentangle that intellectually? I guess I would have to say, which algorithm? Are you just talking about the, the way for, allocation? For, yeah, kidney allocation specifically. Well, again, you know, the thing about it is that you have to look at how algorithms are designed and who the input you have into those algorithms. And that's one of the issues that you have to consider where, when we think about AI development and you know, uh, the, there are flaws within each, 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 all these algorithms. And certainly for transplant, especially for kidney transplant, it's really about how do patients get to the starting line? Uh, and a lot of it occurs be, even before that point when it comes to, if you think about the vast number of patients on dialysis, <clears throat> and even though we have a monitoring, <clears throat> excuse me, a monitoring system that by <clears throat> with uh, Medicare <clears throat> and there's oversight to dialysis units to make sure that a certain percentage of those patients are referred to transplantation. Um, I'm not sure it still exists, but I know 
uh, I always question patients who are dialysis four or five years and coming forth to transplant. Maybe that's not something you see here in, in, in uh, Minnesota, um, but in many rural, many uh, inner cities, my question is always, what took you so long to get to transplant? Uh, and what were, what were the barriers? Who was, who, how was the thinking, what was the thinking involved? Did someone say, uh, you're not an appropriate candidate for transplant for five years based on what? So when they get to the starting line for transplant, they've already missed so many opportunities before they get there. So I think it's about stepping back in the process. Unfortunately, um, it, you have to think about the primary physicians who may not be referring to the nephrologist and the nephrologist not referring to transplant. And those are steps along the way that with education, a patient understanding the disease process, understanding that transplantation is an option or even a better option than dialysis. Uh, the people who, patients who come to me, come to me because, oh, you know, my, my brother was diagnosed with kidney disease and he had to start dialysis. Well, what about transplant? Did anyone discuss transplant to begin with? So we have a society that's biased in how they, they refer patients while you may find that the white male who works at, uh, um, at in, in Wall Street, he has, he has renal disease. It's picked up when his creatinine may be stage three. And before he gets to stage four, he's being referred to consider living donor transplant, which is a lot different than what you see in, in other populations. So it's really, you have to step back. We are, we are only given the ball at the later stage. And so it's really about us as transplant surgeons or even transplant hospitals really educating our community and uh, to be advocates for their own health and to really ask those questions of your doctor, educate families so families can become more engaged to ask the right questions so that they can receive the right treatments. Dr. Humphreyville. Um, <clears throat> excellent talk, thank you so much. Um, my question is, you've done, I think, a lot in your experience down in Alabama to help break down some of these barriers, to help bring more uh, people to transplant and, and improve access. What, in your experience, has been the most impactful way that you've been able to do that? I would have to say engaging patients with education so that they can advocate for better care is probably the most dramatic improvement that I have seen. When I educate the, the community in Mobile who were four hours away from Birmingham, did not have access, sat on the waiting list for 10, 12 years waiting for a kidney transplant. And when I arrived there, knowing that now they have an ability to transplant, <clears throat> to get transplanted and realize that they were not they didn't have that access, even though they felt that they were entitled to have that access. Don't, many patients don't understand why they weren't called, but if you know, we know that in transplant, if you have a kidney, it needs to go in, you know, by the time you call someone four hours away and then you have to wait for the cross match, you're gonna negate that possibility of doing that transplant. So I have to say, patients became engaged. They came together and formed a educational group themselves. And they went out to the community to, further that education within churches, within community centers. Uh, and with that knowledge, they were able to ask better questions. They were able to advocate for their care. Uh, there, were, there were those who, who felt, now I, could, now I can do something about this. And I think that becomes important because oftentimes we, we um, end-stage renal disease, we know some, for many patients, they're aware of so many people who are on dialysis, but the, treatment of transplant or the option of transplant wasn't on the forefront. And I think given with that knowledge, they become much more advocates and, uh, and being able to be proactive about their health. Dr. Brunsville and then Dr. Kinsler. Thank you for that um, really excellent talk, connecting um, surgical outcomes to the issues of um, uh, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation. I think that's really important. One of the things that we see um, sometimes uh, this competency is underrepresented 
Uh, it's very important, but underrepresented in things like the American Board of Surgery exam, uh, the abcite exams and things like that. And occasionally um, we think that it's, these topics are interesting and important, but because they're not tested, it's not key to being a good surgeon. Is there any movement at all to start to include some of these, uh, this competency in um, the American Board of Surgery exams, for example, or uh, to require some type of certificate so that we can really emphasize that this, these kinds of, of this knowledge is critical to us being good surgeons. Thank you for that question. Very, very, actually very important. I'm not sure that, I'm sure it's forthcoming because at this point, you know, one of the things I do at, I'm doing at Dartmouth is part of the deficiency for the medical school was the lack, lack of uh, addressing the social determinants of health in education when it comes to the topics that the, that the students are presented with. So I think it's going to be a gradual recognition that these, these, this aspect of medicine is important. And I hope that it does get to that point, but I'm not sure if there's any movement on that quite yet. You know? Let me see. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I, I just want to respond to that real quick before I get to my comment. I was um, chatting with Patricia Turner, who's the executive director of the ACS a couple of weeks ago in Toronto, and she addressed this very topic, talking about influencing uh, from a, a advocacy from an ACS standpoint towards some kind of formal training, including uh, curriculum training plus uh, competency testing um, that could be done. That The power to do that is through the ABS, obviously. And uh, uh, at, at least there's some preliminary discussions going on offline about it. I don't think anything formal has been tabled, but it's nice to know that uh, people are thinking about it at this point. That's um, good. I'll get to my uh, comment. First of all, I want to thank you for the wonderful talk. It was enlightening and it just uh, illustrates how much work we've got left to do um, for a long time to come uh, to, to work on implicit biases. Uh, you talked about education um, for um, you know, end-stage um, kidney failure and other organ failure patients. And that is a critical part of, uh, of improving awareness and improving outcomes because we know, for example, in African-Americans, uh, incidence of kidney disease is higher and it's not entirely related to genetic factors. There's, uh, there's plenty of environmental factors. And secondly, the progression of the kidney disease is also accelerated. Um, towards this, education plays a big role in addition to the other social interventions. Um, I just wanna give a shout out to a program that you are involved in, um, the MOTEP program, a Minority Organ Tissue and Transplant Education Program, which currently exists, was founded by Clive Callender who introduced me to transplantation in 1991 as a surgical resident, um, formed it then and has was funded by the NIH for a long time and now is uh, independently funded, you said, and you serve on the board, as you mentioned in, in dinner. I just want you to comment on how it's operating now, if there's an opportunity for us to be able to refer patients that we see here uh, to get, uh, you know, to enroll with, with the MOTEB education programs because we would love to do that. I, I just have not been, have been disconnected from the program for a long time. I wanna see if you can uh, help us understand the resources. Well, thank you for that. You know, Dr. Clive Callender, who actually was trained at the Nigerian, who's, and um, uh, probably the second, Dr. Kuntz was the first African-American uh, transplant surgeon. Dr. Callender came after him. Uh, and he formed MOTEP, which is certainly minority organ tissue transplant education, a program started at uh, really to increase organ donation within the Washington DC area, but then realized and then realized that through the power of education, we can impact not only education, but we can begin to focus on transplantation for people of color. Uh, a lot of the work now uh, without funding has gone into one of the, the visions of MOTEP is to have different MOTEP sites. So MOTEP sites were picked to be in areas of greater uh, inner city with higher incidence of end-stage renal disease, such as um, uh, Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati. Um, um, there was one in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, 
Uh, there was one in, in Pennsylvania in that gift of life, but that dissolved, but now they're interested in revamping. So there are like 11 MOTET sites. They operate independently, but the goal, uh, because there's no funding, and so the sites are funded by their local transplant, or they may have their own uh, 501c3 where they bring in their funds to, uh, to really do the work of MOTEP in that area. Uh, and so we now have greater interest in different, uh, different areas wanting to have a MOTEP site. The site is generally funded uh, by the OPO, half by the OPO, half by the transplant center. Um, and so the goal is to really get out into the community, have um, minority ed, uh, a coordinator that's specifically uh, geared towards in educating the minority community, bringing that information and focusing on preventive care. And so uh, really addressing um, practices in, of th those with diabetes and hypertension, how that you not propagate the disease onto your, uh, those in your family, or really addressing the living donation as a really trying to get that, those numbers up to par with addressing the need for more living donation as well as deceased donors. And so, yes, uh, there is an opportunity for uh, those transplant centers who are interested in really getting out into the minority population to, in, to really be a MOTEP site and to continue those practices within the community. So I welcome the opportunity as, and I serve on the board of MOTEP. Sounds like a great opportunity and a great way to end kind of this session. But thank you again, Dr. Scandalway. We're honored to have you here. Fantastic uh, discussion. And we have more uh, opportunity to kind of interact with Dr. Scandalberry today. So thank you. Thank you.